Sunday of the new year. We did a 201 in Sunday school, so we kicked off the new year correctly. So I'd like to remind you, though, if you weren't part of that 201, try to come out and catch Sunday school next week. Special speaker this morning, Brother Daniel Kearns, will bring in his inaugural message since being called into the ministry, so we're excited to hear that today. Deacon's meeting today at 4 p.m. Wednesday, no EBC Kids Club, but we will be having the 412 Student Ministry. So no Kids Club, but yes for the, for the youth ministry. Then our rental Bible study kicks off at 6.30 with Brother Philip Roberts, one of our deacons, being the speaker. Then next Sunday is Baptist Men's Day with Men's Breakfast at 8 a.m. And at this time, we have two announcements from the congregation, Brother Charlie Queen, Sister Debbie Chandler. I said I wanted to go after Charlie because I wanted him to remember what I said. <laughs> Uh, I have two things, ladies. Um, next Sunday evening begins the Open Your Bible uh, Bible study that we're going to be doing during the discipleship training hour. I wanted to read to you just a little bit here out of this Bible study. Um, it's out of the introduction. And it says, why do we open our Bibles? This is a letter from the authors. Sorry. You see, we used to open our Bibles out of obligation. Perhaps you do too. Now we open our Bibles because it feels like coming home. We used to open our Bibles to find ourselves. Now we open our Bibles to find God. Hear the happy desperation in our voices when we admit to you we open our Bibles because we just can't not open our Bibles. We open our Bibles because Jesus, the living word in the flesh, is there in its pages. The Bible is for you and it's for now. But it's not about you. It's about God. It's about his steadfast love for his people. It's about his sovereign plan, his grace, and his glory. And you are meant to read it. No matter where you are, find him when you open your Bible. And I know some of you probably made New Year's resolutions to read your Bible more. So ladies, this is your opportunity to get started. We want to help you with that. The other thing I have, you will see these around the church. This is Restore Women of Joy. It's the conference that we go to in Pigeon Forge in April. It's April 22nd through the 24th. Uh, the total cost is $160, but your deposit is due next Sunday. That's a $50 deposit. But let me say, ladies, if money is an issue, I've been there. Come talk to me. We want you to go. We need you to be there as part of our women. Um, something else, uh, the topic this year is Restore. And I am excited to see how God wants to restore our faith, how he wants to restore our relationships, and how he wants to restore our joy and our salvation. Thank you. Next week's Baptist Men's Day, the, uh, the men that will be doing their testimonies, the men that will be involved with the breakfast, we would love to after this service, just for a few minutes, just meet us in this room right back here so we can pray and uh, come together as one for Baptist Men's Day and what God is trying to do in our men and in this church. Uh, and on the 15th at 6 p.m., we're going to have a bonfire out here at the pavilion. All men are, are invited. We encourage you all to be there. Let's come out and fellowship, see where God's trying to work in our lives, where he wants you to get plugged in for our families, our church, for witnessing, whatever God's doing. Let's join together in unity to accomplish the things God's got in our life. Next Wednesday, or next Friday, the 15th at 6 p.m. at the bonfire, but right out of the church, the men that are involved in Baptist Men's Day and all the phases of it, just meet us in this room for prayer. Thank you. One more. So uh, uh, James James Randall and I have been uh, working with Pastor a little bit, talking about uh, bringing back. We've had in the past some some small groups, and uh, God's blessed our church. He's grown our church, and uh, just there there might be several of you here that have been here quite a while or just started coming, and you're looking for just an opportunity to kind of build a, some closer connections with people. Uh, in the pew, there'll be little cards. Uh, that uh, you pull those out, and it's just a survey of interest. If you're interested, you can put your name. If you're married, there's a spot for a spouse name. And then you'll see three different 
opportunities to be a part of that. You can either just say you want to you want to attend. You can host and host it in your home, or, or or you can leave. And so there are three opportunities. Be praying about those. If you would, you can fill those out, put them in the offering plate. If you'd like to take them with you and bring them back next week, we're going to have another announcement next week. Just to give you an idea of you know what what the idea of the small group thing is is basically uh, just to kind of kind of take a regular time, uh, a couple times a month, get together with some other believers, get to know them personally, what's going on in their lives, and do a very simple like devotional type Bible study, just to focus on not just a, a or bigger community of the church, but pulling in some individual unity and, and actually uh, getting to know each other that much better. And so if you would, please look for those cards and uh, by the hymn books, fill those out and uh, turn them in and uh, bring them back next week at, at the lunch. Thank you. Uh, thanks, folks. If our ushers would come forward, we'd like to recognize any guests or visitors who may be here. If you are a guest or a visitor, we're going to give you a, either a blue or orange pen today. I ask that you keep that pen as a gift from the church and return the card which is attached in the offering plate as you're offering to us today. And also, during our time of fellowship, if you'd remain seated just so, just until you get your card so that ushers can identify who you are and maybe our welcome coordinator can find you, that, that would help out greatly. But if you miss our welcome coordinator on your way out, stop by our welcome center and we'll give you a bit larger gift as a thanks for you coming today. So if our members and records will stand, we'll now resume fellowshipping. Thanks. Good morning. If you'll have a seat, listen as the choir sings. Thank you. 
I'll rise to live beyond the grave because I believe it right here in my heart. This next song is one of our favorites that came from Christmas. I know you go, well, you're doing your favorites? Well, this morning we are. This is one of my favorites that we did at Christmas. It's called, um, yeah, and I just forgot the name of it. Call Him Jesus. All week I've called it a different name, but it's Call Him Jesus. It's just a toe tapper. And he is Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and Savior. Listen as we sing. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, he shall be great, Jesus, and of his kingdom there shall be no Jesus, end. He shall be called Jesus, Wonderful, call Counselor, Jesus, the Mighty God, Jesus, the Everlasting Prince of Peace. Jesus, His name shall be called Jesus. He is wonderful. He is the counselor. He is the mighty king. The Bible goes on to say that he's the beautiful one. He's beyond all the beauty that we could ever imagine. He is beautiful one. Would you stand and sing it with me? Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Beautiful one, my soul must 
powerful. Powerful, so powerful, your glory fills the skies. Your mighty works display for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to see. How marvelous, how wonderful you are. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. You opened my eyes to your wonders and you captured my heart with this love. There's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You opened my eyes to your wonders and you, you captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. Beautiful one, I love a beautiful one, I adore. Sing that again. Beautiful one, I love, beautiful one, I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. Are you happy you're here this morning? Yes. It's good to see a new year. It's 2016. When I was a kid, I thought 50 was dead. <laughs> you know, I'm now 50 plus. I never thought I'd see 2016. I could never imagine that. 2000, 2020 is not that far away. But this is my question. What are we going to do this year for God? He's done everything for us. What are we going to do in 2016 for God? He lives inside of us to give us a mission to go and do. So what is it we're going to do this year? Think about that as we sing this song. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see His hand. Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me. life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, so oh Christian. Eternal hallelujah. Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. The love who is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He lives, He lives, salvation. 
permission to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Smile. I was, he lives within my heart. This next song, it's, it's a newer song that we learned just a few months ago, but it says, Christ is my reward and all my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Christ is enough for me.
Children's Church. You're dismissed at this time. Is it on? Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, I just want to take a quick second and introduce myself to the people that may not know me. Uh, I'm Daniel Kearns, um, and I'm a student at Moody Bible Institute in Spokane, Washington, uh, going to school to be a pastor. So practice. <laughs> um, and I want to. I want to also thank you, or thank the church, for all the prayers that you said for me. Uh, while I've been up in Washington, and uh, and I've got several cards from members of the church, and that's that's been really really an awesome thing to get in the mail, and just know that people are are thinking about you back home. Uh, so today I want to begin in Matthew four eighteen to twenty two, um, and if you want to stand while I read, I guess. <laughs> Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with, their, with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Uh, now, I'm, uh, I guess let's pray. Lord, we thank you for letting us be here today, and uh, Father, I ask that you help us to uh, learn from this message and uh, just take away what you want us to hear, Lord. Uh, Lord, I ask that you just speak through me and let everything go according to your plan. <clears throat> All right. So as an overview of this passage, uh, the whole passage is about Jesus calling his disciples. Um, so like before we get into it, uh, I just want to go over what a disciple is, uh, the definition of a disciple. In the Lexingham Theological Wordbook describes a disciple as one who seeks to learn from another. A disciple is not only a partaker of information, but also who seeks to become like his or her teacher in this way. Uh, discipleship is about modifying one's entire lifestyle. Uh, I think there's really like a lesson in that of just if we're if we're called to be a disciple, then it's not just learning, but it is seeking to become more like your teacher. We should 
constantly be wanting to become more like Christ. Uh, uh, And now starting in verse 18, now as Jesus was walking in the sea, by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Uh, this verse will give us a little background, so we know that they're by the Sea of Galilee, which would be near Jesus' home in Capernaum. Um, uh, and we know Peter and Andrew, and that they are fishermen, uh, which will become very important. Um. It's not mentioned here in this passage, but uh, we do know that this is not Peter and Andrew's first encounter with Jesus. Uh, if you read First uh, John 1, 35 to 41, Andrew was a disciple of John, and they had previously seen Jesus walking, and John said, behold the Lamb of God. So they, these two brothers at least knew who Jesus was. Um, and then uh, verse 19, uh, and he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, so fishers of men pretty much just means that uh, he will teach them to go out and gather others willing to follow. But follow me is a very interesting phrase. Um, the, it literally translates to come after me. In the same sense as in Matthew uh, 3.11, it says the one coming after me when John the Baptist is talking about Jesus following up his ministry. Um, And then this, like, it means follow follow as one would follow a leader. Um, So when Jesus tells them to follow me, it's a command to follow me as your leader. Like... um, Uh, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Um, I, this verse just like, it fascinates me because it says immediately they left their nets. Um, the, these two men, they were fishermen by trade. Like that was, that was their job. That was their career. Fishing is how they made all their money. Like that's how they lived. So when it says they left their nets, um, like, they left everything to follow God. Um, and then looking at this word followed, uh, the Greek word for followed means, or it implies discipleship. So not only follow him, but follow him in discipleship, wanting to learn and become more like him. And this, like, one instant, like, immediately they left their nets and followed him with, like, no hesitation. Like, that's amazing. Uh, Moving on to verses 21 and 22, we'll see the same pattern of call and response with James and John. Uh, So, going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them. They, like, I mean, they were mending their nets. This was something they, they would take care of, their nets. It was a very important tool to them. Again, this is how... This is how they live. Without their nets, they couldn't fish. Without fish, they had no money. They had no food. They, it just wasn't going to be good if they didn't have a net. Um, and he calls them. Um, and then in verse 22, we see their response. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. So, I mean, leaving their boat and their father... Their boat, it's, it's in the same line with their net. It's, they need that to survive. They need that to make money. Um, and then their father, I mean, that's their family. So this was probably like a family business that they, they had. This was probably, they've grown up on that boat fishing. Like that has been their entire life. They leave their family, they leave their career to follow God. They, like, they gave him their entire life in that one, just like one one command, they gave him their entire life. Um, so uh, when we're commanded to follow God, this should not be taken lightheartedly. Um, 
the command to follow is a command to surrender your life to him. Um, we should follow as disciples seeking to become more like Christ. Uh, and I want to also go to Matthew nineteen sixteen to 22. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me what is good? There is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter eternal life, the, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, that you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he, he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. Uh, this is the story of the rich, rich young ruler, which I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, and when it says young that can mean anywhere from like 20 to 40. Uh, and ruler uh, probably means that he was a synagogue official. Um, so this would be a well-educated and uh, a looked up to man. So the simple fact that he asked Jesus this question, like this was a, a very humbling thing for him to do was to go to somebody else and ask, how do I gain eternal life? So we know just, just because he's asking Jesus this, he is he's very sincere about this and like he he really does want life like he's not trying to trap Jesus with a question that he can't answer or like hoping he answers it wrong or something trying to trap him so he can have blackmail on him or something like that. Um, uh, verse verse 16 is when he asks his question uh, asking how, how I attain, obtain eternal life again he's asking for salvation. Uh, and he like he honestly wants salvation because uh, he feels something is lacking from his life. Uh, Seventeen is uh, Jesus's response to him, which when I read it, I, I thought it was a kind of strange response. Uh, like it, it, I would think if somebody came to us saying, "How do I gain eternal life?" We would say, "We'll follow Jesus." What does Jesus say? Follow the commandments. We know the only way to life is through God's grace, so that doesn't really make sense. Um, but Jesus knows the man's heart, and like through throughout this whole like back and forth of him asking and answering questions, Jesus is trying to make them or have the man understand his own sinfulness uh, to kind of get be prepared. For the ultimate answer of you have to follow Jesus. Um, uh, so verse 17, he says, why are you asking me what is good? There is only one who is good. Um, this is probably like a way of kind of prying out the man's thoughts on Jesus. Because um, he says, there's only like, why are you asking me? There's only one who is good. So is he asking Jesus because he thinks he is the one who is good? Or does he just think Jesus is uh, just like an especially gifted teacher and he's just hoping he can like be kind of insightful on salvation? Oh. The man never gives a response to uh, Jesus saying that there is only one who is good. So he probably thinks that Jesus is more than just a gifted teacher. Um, I don't know that he tr like fully believes that he's the son of God but I would say he's at least like open to the idea of it. Um, and then uh, he goes on to say, uh, keep the commandments. And I thought that was really weird. Um, and the man asked what commandments he should keep. Um, he would be asking this because... Uh, he, he's probably a synagogue official. He, I mean, he's a Jewish man who he grew up, and like since he was a child, he's known the commandments. 
He's committed on to memory at a very young age, and he's always made it a point to follow the commandments. Um, so this would be, like, I mean, that answer would be nothing new to him. That's what he's been trying all along. But he still feels something is lacking. Um, so he's asking which one is like, have I missed something? Um, is there something I'm not getting from these commandments? Is there one commandment that I don't know? Um, and Jesus goes on to say, uh, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and then he tacks on at the end, uh, you shall, or yeah, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, it's interesting because the five, five commandments that he quotes, they all are man, man's relationship with man. Um, he doesn't even mention the first four commandments, which are man's relationship to God. This is almost a uh, him challenging the man on, like, you can't keep these these five commandments of man and man, which would be the easiest to keep, like the least impossible to keep. I'm not even going to mention the ones with your relationship with God, which there's no way you're going to keep. Um, and then the young man replies, uh, he said, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? When he says all these things I have kept, um, he honestly, he's probably very sincere about this. He, um, being being the, the Jewish man that he is, um, he would he would have thought in his own eyes that he had kept these commandments. Um, like all the scribes and Pharisees of that time, he would be convinced he had kept God's law. Um, but his view on the commandments would be superficial, external, and man-oriented. Um, so because he did not commit physical adultery or murder, he was not a thief or a liar, he did not blaspheme the Lord's name or worship idols, he would probably view himself as perfect in God's eyes. So when he says, all these things I've kept, he thinks that he's kept them correctly. He just has a wrong view of what the commandments are. Um, but he says, the, the, what am I still lacking? So he knows, he knows that, even, like, that this, like what he's been doing is not enough. He knows there is still something missing from his life. Um, and in verse 21, uh, Jesus tells him, if you wish to be complete, Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you, you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Um, that's, that's the command to give up everything and follow him. Uh, and in verse 22, we see that when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. The word there, grieved, um, it is like, it would mean genuinely upset. Like, I mean, he was... He was very saddened by the fact that he wasn't going to gain eternal life, that, that he was going to go away empty-handed. Um, this, was, like, this was still a very big deal to him. Um, uh, it was possible that he was so upset, he only heard the first part of what God said, on, or Jesus said, on saying... Um, sell your possessions and give to the poor. He may not have even heard him say, come follow me. Um, we see that the man was just too too attached to his his earthly things, his property here, that he, he could not let go of it to follow. Um, it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, so he walked away. Um, Again, th this command to follow God, it's a command to give our life to him. Um, he should be the first thing in our lives, uh, and we should constantly seek to be more like him. Um, I want you to think back to the disciples and their nets um, and how they were willing to drop everything when he said, follow me. Um, and I just want you to think, are you, are you willing to be like the disciples uh, that just gave their life to God so easily, so readily? Or are you like the rich young ruler who, who lets his property get in the way of his relationship with Christ? Wonderful.
Thank you, Daniel. I just want to, um, uh, since this is Daniel's first message, I wanted to kind of challenge him a little bit to continue in uh, teaching and preaching God's word as he did this morning and to keep that the focus. Um, and Daniel certainly challenged us to be followers of Jesus Christ. He talked about, you know, what it, what it means to be to make that profession of faith in Jesus. And I want to just put the message in just a little bit more of a context in, in what was happening um, in chapter 4, right before Jesus called his disciples to follow him. Like I said, Daniel, uh, again, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge all of us as a church and, and people, teachers, and, and those who, who teach God's word that, uh, that we are to, to teach this message. Uh, we are to, uh, to live God's word out within our lives each and every day. Jesus had just been tried in the wilderness there, beginning at chapter 4, by Satan after he had fasted for 40 days. And it was so intense that he was so weak afterwards, angels had to come and minister to him. So after this uh, going through this physical, this emotional, this uh, spiritual battle, the next thing that he hears is that Herod has been arrest, uh, has arrested John the Baptist. And Herod silenced John's voice by cutting off his head, but now a far more powerful voice is going to be heard. And so Jesus begins his ministry exactly where John left off uh, when he says there in verse 17, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he would call Peter and Andrew and the other two disciples by commanding him to follow me. You know, the herods of this world can never silence the voice of God. They may kill the preacher, but they cannot kill the preaching. But his truth will continue to march on. And so, Daniel, as you begin your ministry, I just want to encourage you to preach the word of God. Give the full counsel of God, just as you've done to us this morning. Uh, preaching was the central part of Jesus' ministry. A preaching is to be the central part of the ministry of the church. And to preach here just means to proclaim. It means to publish. It's not to argue or reason. We don't have to dispute with people. We don't have to try to convince even with intellectual proof. We simply are to testify to all men the truth of God. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. There are, are a certain characteristics, though, of preaching to make it biblical preaching. First, uh, there is that note of certainty. Uh, there's no doubt about the message. Jesus did not go before these men with maybes or probably, or perhaps it's the way life is. He came with a definite message. Uh, Goth, Goth said it right. He says, tell me of your, uh, your certainties. I have doubts enough of my own. So Jesus preached his message with certainty. He did not uh, come to dispute or to argue, but he came to proclaim and to preach. This is the word of God. And a preacher isn't to just him haul around, uh, but he's to speak with the authority of God's word. And the reason that many people today, the reason that many churches are in trouble today is simply because we're not bold enough to say, thus saith the Lord. So Daniel, every time you preach, you say, thus saith the Lord. This is God's word. We've got to point, uh, got, uh, we've gotten to a point uh, in many uh, uh, of churches and many of our societies that we don't know the word of God from the word of man and it, it's been watered down so much. We live in a society of opinions and we have this speculation which is killing our society. You may remember uh, Daryl Scott's testimony who was the father of Rachel Scott before Congress, before uh, uh, the Columbine High School uh, shooting. Um, some were just trying to place the blame upon the, of that atrocity upon the National Rifle Association. But as Mr. Scott points out, the issue wasn't the guns, but the heart. And when there was no guns, you know, Cain's heart was so wicked, he picked up a rock to kill his brother. And so this is what Scott said to Congress. He says, I'm here today to declare that Columbine was not just a tragedy. It was a spiritual event that should be forcing us to look at, at where uh, the real blame lies. Much of the blame lies here in this room. Much of the blame lies behind the pointing fingers uh, of the accusers themselves. I wrote a poem just four nights ago uh, that expresses my feelings best. This was written way before I knew I would be speaking to you today. He says this, he says, your laws ignore our deepest needs. Your words are empty air. You've stripped away our heritage. You've out, uh, outlawed simple prayer. Now gunshots fill the classroom and precious children die. You seek for answers everywhere and ask the question why. Uh, you regulate restrictive laws uh, through legislative creed 
and yet you fail to understand that God is what we need. You know, church, we have God's word to proclaim and we're to speak it with authority. Uh, Daniel preached with the voice of God. I preach with the authority, thus saith the Lord. Deliver your message as it's life and death because this is a message of life and death. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's saying eternity has entered time. That King Jesus is here and he's near. And so let this remind us when, when we preach and we witness, we're not just, you know, defending the doctrine. Or we're not just to reform society. We're not to even present a message. We're calling people to Jesus Christ. We're here to introduce them to a person to Jesus Christ. This whole thing is not about religion, but a relationship with the one who loved us so much he sent his only begotten son that whomsoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus' kingdom, uh, kingdom of heaven, he says, is at hand. But you know, you cannot share in his kingdom this morning. You cannot have that eternal life in heaven without repenting of your sin and believing the good news. To have God's light of salvation to shine in us, we must repent of our sin. We must turn it around and seek a new way. That word repent just means to change the way that you look at sin and righteousness. It involves a change of your opinion, your direction in life, life itself. It's a radical change of heart uh, that will, uh, will, uh, and will which, which leads to a change of your behavior. Listen, that's always the first demand of the gospel. That's always the first requirement of salvation. The first element of saving, or, uh, of saving work of the Spirit is in our hearts. It is the mark of true saving faith when we become a new creation in Christ. You know, Jesus does not allow people to sit on the fence. And he calls them to do something about the good news. He says to Daniel, follow me. And hearing this message today, it's not enough. You will either be like the disciples Daniel said to accept it. You'll leave forgiven today. You leave saved. You leave changed. You become a new creation of Christ. Or you will leave like the rich young man, unforgiven and lost, and eventually would be cast into hell. And so if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to accept him into your heart today. The kingdom of heaven is near. Will you repent of your sin and invite Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? You know, in New York at, at a park, um, an atheist was spouting off his beliefs and he uh, took his watch off and set it up on the podium and he cried out, if there's a God, strike me dead within five minutes. And five minutes elapsed and, and he said, well, you see, there isn't a God. And a lady turned to her friend and said, how foolish is he to think that he can exhaust God's patience in just five minutes. Listen, God is patient. He's been patient with you if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior. But, you know, some, at some point, that patient runs out. And today, he says, is the day of salvation. Today is the day to commit your life to him if you don't know him. What will you do with this message that uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand Will you follow Jesus Christ today as Daniel preached to us? Will you acknowledge that you're a sinner? Will you repent of that sin and turn to Jesus Christ and be given eternal life? That's the message we have for our world. Won't we stand? And we just want to have a time of invitation. Won't we just bow our heads and let's just start in